Every collection is a story, and the story told by the Oak Collection is of the determination of one man to seek out and to surround himself with the most beautiful and important timepieces. It is a story of a magnificent obsession that began when he was a child at school in Switzerland and that has continued in the world's most famous auction rooms, watch salon and horological atelier. Now, the time has come to tell the story of the Oak Collection and its families of watches in the galleries of the Design Museum. To walk among these painstakingly assembled sets of watches is to see not just individual pieces, but meticulously curated families, sets, and pairs that, when viewed together, definitively demonstrate the almost infinite variety that can be achieved by the subtlest differences in design, choice of color, or type of metal. To see such a number of rare timepieces in one place affords a unique opportunity to appreciate the richness of the watch as a cultural object. The collection spans the full spectrum of horological expression and emotion. There is the sober and chaste simplicity of the Calatrava family, exemplified by the unique reference 530A. Alternatively, we can experience the exuberance of the vibrant enameled dials, whether depicting the tropical island paradise of reference 2482, or the Geneva tradition of the Escalade, reference 5189G021, their jewel bright colors as vivid as the day they were made. As it traces the lineage of complications and grand complications, the Oak Collection invites us to admire a remarkable set of 1579 chronographs and quite stunning examples of the legendary perpetual calendar chronograph references 1518 and 2499. Along the journey taken by the Oak Collection, there are fascinating and tempting details to be taken, such as into the historically significant set of watches carrying the fabled Graves provenance. A magical name among collectors, Henry Graves Jr. is considered the preeminent collector of the last century. In addition, the Oak Collection takes us through the great classics of Rolex, and brings us right up to date with rare sets of watches made by the most exciting independent watchmakers working today. At the end of the journey, there is one task left, meeting the man who throughout the years has passionately and patiently assembled the different families that together make the Oak Collection. Jetred is a very world-renowned collector. He's a truly passionate person. He's obviously such a lively character. He fills the room. Sometimes you can feel that the person is a true person, somebody who really loves watches. He's been uh, one of our collectors uh, at Christie's for so many years. We've had many conversations about watches. You can talk for hours with him about his watch collection. Mr. Jetred, uh, I will place him just uh, just after the Graves and Parker uh, collectors. He loves Calatrava and he has probably the best selection ever. Within his collection, there's over 50 brands. Watches are like paintings, works of art. Um, they have to be exhibited. That unconditional love that he's expressing as a bidder and later as the proud owner. It takes a lot of energy to build up a collection. It's chemistry and it either makes click or it doesn't. Patrick, where do we start? Now first, I start without knowing, because there are some people who start collecting at 25, 30, but they know about the watch. I didn't know nothing. I just bought some watch and, uh, that I liked, Cartier, Gégère Le Coultre, and all those watches. The second, I didn't have enough money to buy the, the, the Patek when I learned this Patek, so I had to wait a little bit. And uh, the first watch I bought, it was a 3970 that I still have. And uh, it was uh, fantastic. It was even difficult to pay because it was a big amount for me. It's gradually assumed a greater part of your life because I know you, you had some lovely motor cars, for example, you had some beautiful paintings. 
But what is it about watches? Because you had, a, you had a nice collection of paintings, you had nice cars, and you had nice watches. I had 43 cars. And the thing is, the emotion that I have with the watch, nothing to do in the car or in the painting. That's why after I focus for the watch, because that's, that's my, my best, my bigger emotion. I love it. You get as much pleasure from a simple time-only timepiece as you do from a grand complication. For sure, and also new watch. I don't collect only vintage, I collect also new watch. Like this one, it's a 5236 from Patek, just went out, yes. QP, platinum, goes uh, in the underwater, and, 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 and I love it. I, 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 trois guichets, three guichets. He's got the same pleasure of buying a watch today than it was 11 years ago. Watch collectors are very secretive. Only a few watch dealers and a few watch friends know the extent of their collections. His relationship to his watches is to what, maybe to some who have dogs or cats. Mm -hmm. uh, it's living. It's, it's part of their most intimate sphere of their lives. In the history of Patek Philippe, the chronograph with perpetual calendar is very, very important. It was uh, first uh, uh, on the market, let's say, uh, in 1941. And this is the first, uh, let's say, double complication, chronograph and perpetual calendar, uh, that has been uh, manufactured by a, by a watch manufacturer. And what is very impressive is that for more than 40 years, the only brand who manufactured the chronograph with perpetual calendar was Patek Philippe. So um, a chronograph with perpetual calendar at Patek has a very, very strong history. And the 1518 was the first to be produced by Patek. And he has uh, one of the, I would say, most beautiful pink gold chronograph is a reference 530. Uh, it's quite large for the time being because uh, it's a 37 millimeters, just a little bit above uh, 37 millimeters. So for the time, it, it, is a, it is considered as a big watch and it is really a very sought after piece today because it's, once again, it's quite big. Uh, and this 530 is a, has a wonderful dial. As we say it in our language, it has two-tone dial. This one is a 1506 super rare because Patek has only a few of them and uh, you never see. Uh, it's uh, once every 10 years one mm -hmm. goes uh, under uh, that you can see this watch. The 1579 I think is, is, is one of the favorites um, in the Mr. Getred's collection and the 1579 that we have here is particularly special because it comes from the original family. It was fresh to market when it came up. We were absolutely thrilled to be able to get uh, Mr. Getred um, excited on this piece. And the condition was really, really phenomenal. And we were obviously excited by the fact that it was double signed. Mm -hmm. And then we were excited by the fact that it had an unusual bezel. So obviously we had questions about that and were wondering if this was really made at the time, mm -hmm. especially this way. And, and further to our research and to analyzing the bezel, the weight, the weight of the bezel itself is impressive. And it gives, in fact, a whole different feeling to the watch when you have it in hand that creates this magic about it. And I think to be completely into all these models and wanting to align them one after the other to be able to fill in the puzzle the way it's, he's done it is absolutely exceptional. What is interesting about the 1518, which is the first ever uh, reference with both um, chronograph perpetual and perpetual calendar and moon phase is the readability in the dial. People talk very often about the mechanics at Patek, but we have to talk about the dial because if we look at the history of Patek, uh, when the Stern family took over in 1932, yes. they were dial makers. Of course. And I always found, and this is something really interesting, I always found that with Patek, dial is always perfect. The dial is the face of the watch. When you look at the watch, the first thing you will see is the color of the dial. It's the beauty of the dial. Then you will see the case, and finally you will see the movement. Take a loop 
you know take a, a dial and just look at it and you will see all those little details whom are making the difference and I think that's very important you know there is this kind of um, shiny um, rainbow when you look at the watch you know sometimes uh, um, collectors say oh is this dial original is it being refinished or so on there is always this uh, lacquer on mm -hmm. the dial which is absolutely exceptional I mean if you look at this 1518 it's almost like a rainbow. You can see all the colors, you can see um, everything on the dial. And I think this is one of the aspects, it's the face of the watch. You know, it's like a painting. People mm. love paintings, but the first impression is, what does it look like? A watch is the same. Firstly, you think of, wow, one of the top complications in modern Pateks. But I think what you clearly see beyond uh, the mono pusher beyond the perpetual calendar, you see the slide, you see the fact that it is a beautiful mini repeater. And, and the lugs are very interesting again, aren't they? The lugs, the lugs are very contemporary and very unusual from what we've seen with Patek before. And the fact also that the case is, is also quite large, uh, but is more standardized to today's taste. Mm -hmm. But I, I think really what's important, what I find really attractive and sometimes almost romantic because some people would say, why, why do we still need to listen to time when we can just look at it? Yes. And the fact that it's a musical instrument of time, I find that absolutely exciting. The, the sound, the chime that it gives. It's absolutely phenomenal to get this sharpness of sound. I'm sure the most historically important or valuable in the eyes of the community would be the reference 2523 in yellow gold with a unbelievable blue center disc in, in translucent enamel. That is definitely one that comes to my mind. Here on the pocket watch, what's absolutely amazing is the slimness. We keep talking about the dial, we keep talking yeah. about uh, how complicated it is and Louis Coutier's movement. But we can see the practicality at the time also that was that we could easily slip this in through our vest, we could keep with us, we could have it with a chain and you can look at the time. A time that today we would just flick through the wrist, but yeah. I think the pocket watches have this charm that it seems to be appealing and seems to be coming back to certain collectors. I think it's a journey. I think it's a journey of when you start with wristwatches, then you'd want to go down in history and try to understand what happened before. The fact that the world times are in fashion, I think they've always been in fashion. Mm -hmm. I think because they are so rare and we don't see them usually that often. The last time we had a world time was also a decade ago. So mm -hmm. it's very difficult to come by. So I think that creates more of the excitement. outstanding enamel pieces. So this is really interesting because you're right, they are fantastic. This one is a very, very, very small production, mm -hmm. very limited on, on the Lac de Genève. Yes. And uh, it is fantastic. Patek Philippe had always in this collection beautiful enamel pieces. Now the difficulty was always the same. How can you put something so beautiful like enamel on a tiny watch with like maybe 35, 36 millimeter? Uh, the idea was always to have something very functional and also very artistic. What I'm always amazed is how the people who work can do those so tiny, tiny, tiny design in a small place. There are dynasties of uh, enamelers, and I think Patek Philippe is probably at the forefront of the art of enameling, uh, not to mention these um, famous uh, enamelers which are still working for uh, Patek Philippe today. And yes, within this collection, we've called it rare handcraft. This is exceptional, exceptional, exceptional. This is 2481, this one 2482, more rare. But the design here is maybe better, I don't know. Really, this is, uh, there is nothing to say. Mr. Getred has the most amazing uh, Calatrava collection in the world. The Calatrava is a Greek temple and the Acropolis. It is perfect. It's not an object of fashion. 
its pure beauty. I think it's the black color. Mm -hmm. We think that black is easy to do, easy to make, and in fact, it's one of the hardest colors to produce. And I think, for that matter, it makes it quite special because you are staying elegant. Patek rarely makes black dye, especially in the vintage world. Mm -hmm. And to be able to have that in enamel on a 2526, I think it doesn't get any better than this. It's absolutely phenomenal. And we've seen a lot, unfortunately, that have cracked. We've seen a lot that, you know, have been restored. And here we have an example that survived beautifully over the years. And I think that makes it truly special. I think it's, it has this intellectual part to it that is beyond just the design and the looks in the sense that when you understand craftsmanship, like we're going to be talking maybe about the pocket watch later, is how these are made and how these are produced and the cooking process and the craft that comes behind that that is left out today where we're very few enamelers still being able to do it. I think then you appreciate truly how this has been made and that's why it stands out, I think, uh, in the collection. For Calatrava, this is the, the top of the top. Yes. This is what we call the Yukun Kun, because it's, a, of course, one of a kind, 530. And also, it's a black, breguet dial uh, number, and uh, one of a kind. Most people don't even know of its existence. Um, we know of the Daytona, we know of the Sub, we know of the GMT, but coming to their most complicated movement, in fact, a chrono of a triple calendar, uh, makes it quite special. And I think that's the curiosity about it, and I think that's why you have top collectors also looking into these watches for these reasons, is the fact that it's offering something superior and something different than what mm -hmm. Rolex usually does, which is a very short production, a complicated move and nevertheless, mm -hmm. nevertheless a sports watch that would be water resistant, that could be worn on different occasions, and that offers the charm here of a two-tone dial, um, bringing in a lot of character in life. This particular dial here has aged superbly, typically to the inside, taking this ivory color. And I think a lot of the collectors are into these details. And the, the Rolex collectors are about finding the different aspects of the watch that could be different from another and trying to find obviously the condition that goes with it and which is even harder to find in fact with Rolex because they were so worn out. Every collector is dreaming to have something special. They are willing to have the unique piece that the other one can not have. To obtain a special order at Patek Philippe isn't a privilege available to everyone. I decided at one point uh, to make him a surprise, yeah. Actually, he didn't know about that, so it took me about a year and a half to make the, the piece, and it is the piece 5320, so it's the new perpetual calendar on the Calatrava line. And that's really a unique piece, so for a collector like Mr. Jetra to have such a piece, it's something, it's, it's kind of uh, an achievement. These two watches are very important, maybe the third and the second and third most important watch of Calatrava. One is pink gold, one is yellow gold. Mm -hmm. Both of them I had to fight. I broke world record when I bought it. They are one of a kind and it was a huge fight. So what happened is that I talked to Thierry Stern and he was very nice enough to make two new ones, the same from the 1940-50, but today, so, so we have, I have the old one, the vintage, and the two new ones. So you've got almost like new old stock and new new stock. Yes. You can be a collector, you can collect Patek, you can collect vintage, but very few, if not none, have the privilege to get the same identical watches, one of a kind of the one that you've bought. Most of my watches are all new stock. Yes. They must be all top. The dial, the, the boîte, the, the mechanism, it has to be untouched and new. And that, that's what's making it sometimes difficult to buy because there is not so many top, 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 top watch. And it's also the reason in the last 15 years why I broke so many world records because once it was there, I was there to buy you it. You pay tomorrow's price? Yes. We have two watches here. 
One is a Patek. What is special? It's one of a kind. And uh, it's fantastic and thank you, thank you, thank you. Because uh, when everybody is fighting to get a Nautilus, yes. <laughs> I had one, one of a kind. So that, that, that's, that's fun and, 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 and thank you to Patek. And this one is a Paul Newman 6239 yes. from uh, Apollo 7, Mr. Cunningham, yes. and he went on the sky. Henry Graves um, was among these two big collectors for Patek at the beginning of the century. You had on one side James Ward Packard, and then you had on the other side um, Henry Graves Jr., who was a banker in uh, New York. And they had a sort of competition among them to whom was going to build um, the best complicated uh, watch ever. The platinum Henry Graves Junior Tourbillon was the first watch that Patrick Retret acquired that came from that mythical collection. This watch is from 1935, I think, and this is the second most important Patek for Henry Graves. I'm the biggest collector of Henry Graves after the Patek Museum. I say that this is 2020. Yeah. You cannot find better. The, the watch is new. Henry Graves is a myth. This complicated tourbillon, excellent condition. This is one of the most important watches in the world. The two extremes that come to my mind in the collection are, of course, on one hand, the iconic complications from the heydays of wristwatch making, 40s, 50s. And there, I must say, including a two crown world time with enamel dial, possibly one of maybe the most beautiful selection of 1518s. Mm -hmm. The 1518 is, if you will, a Calatrava in yes. its, in its uh, design language. But the, f the world's first model ever to be featured with a perpetual calendar and a chronograph these are watches that have graced auction catalogs, uh, covers of auction catalogs, and have made world records all across the last 15 or so years. On the other side of the spectrum, you have, I believe, the world's best selection of Calatravas. Um, the two large Calatravas, the 530 reference and the 570 reference, one that has the more cylindrical flat bezel, the other one the more the concave bezel. Um, large for their period, 36 millimeters, that in my view still today is the most wonderful size to wear. And there in Patrick's collection you have the one and only that I've ever seen, pink on pink, three-tone dial with Prigay numerals, one of my personal favorites. Um, the same configuration in yellow gold with champagne three-tone dial. The one and only black dial ever seen with Breguet numerals in spectacular condition. This group, and there's half a dozen more uh, of these variants, is I think both to Patrick and to me personally very dear. 500 watches of this collection they are all in absolutely perfect shape. In every collection, there are some good items, there are some maybe mistakes made by the collector when he started his collection. Uh, and there are, I would say, normally 15 or 20% of, of watches or works of art uh, who are not of the best standards. Everything is on a scale from one to 10, 11 and a half. It remains still very personal how you do a collection. People will see the story, people will understand what has been created, and I think this is what we want. We want to inspire. The collection is there to inspire other people to collect the way they want, but it'll give them the highest standard of what is it that is exceptional. And, and I think that's, that's what we want people to take away from, from that. I think that this collection is standing out thanks to a number of key features. One is, the variety. It spans way over a century of 
Patek Philippe's history, mm -hmm. way over a century. Of course, there is a focus on the 20th century and not the earlier decades in the 19th century, um, maybe understandably. Uh, then it isn't monotonous. As much as Patrick is not monotonous, mm -hmm. um, the collection is colorful, is lively, and includes a great early generation Nautilus, as much as an extremely humble looking Calatrava, because it is humble looking. Technical watches, historical watches, watches owned by famous people, by uh, politicians, queens, artists. It's varied, but it's not without orientation. There's a focus, despite its impressive size. But if you were to say, Aurel, name the five top collectors in the world, mm -hmm. and yes, of course, I would immediately mention Patrick's collection. And you would ask me then, so here they are, here's in one room this collection, in another room this. You can pick one and have it for yourself. Whatever the dollar value could be behind those five collections, I could imagine trying to walk home with Patrick's collection for myself. The Oak Collection looks to me very personal. It goes incredibly deep in, 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 in certain areas. And it seems to be what, you know, one of the great collections of watches in the world, if not the great collection. So why wouldn't we be interested in showcasing it? Patrick Gertred is a visionary. He's not thinking short term, he's thinking long term. He has a good vision about the product of today and also the product of tomorrow. So if I had, uh, for example, to take him in a creation um, meeting, I'm sure he would be very good. Not every collector uh, do have the same idea and the same vision about a new product. He has it. So when we talk with him, it's always dangerous for me because sometimes he can talk about a product who is already in the pipe. And this is sometimes very tricky for, for, me, for myself because I, I cannot tell him, oh yes, of course, this is what I'm doing. You know, I have to keep it secret. But he could certainly bring something for, for, for sure uh, quite new for Paddock. He's not playing a game just for money. He's enjoying his watches. The opportunity to show an unbelievable watch collection that I didn't know existed. It gives us an opportunity to go deeper into something that the more I've thought about it, the more it lies at the heart of what human beings understand fundamentally by design. This exhibition will trigger the desire for collectors to look at other exhibitions. And I wouldn't be surprised if the grand public will probably be interested as a result of this first exhibition of our collector. There was a time it was said that wristwatches had had their day, that people's phones would take over. Because there is some, something beautifully and atavistically essential about being able to just flick at your wrist and look at the time. I think watches are works of art, and this is a fact. Uh, once you buy watches, once you love watches, it's almost like a never-ending story.